So, so John, you asked us to look at eight different covariates um, in this right. analysis. Right. I'd like to go through each of them briefly so that we can just get your thoughts as to what they mean. Um, the first one was sex ego. The second one was sex alter. So if you're an ego or alter, and it's all male or all female houses, how would either of them be different? Um, there, because that would, that would show a difference in um, network patterns um, according to whether a house was female or male. Obviously, if there's no variation within a house, then whatever variation you're explaining there must be at a house level. But it would tell us whether women and men, for example, differ systematically. Here, here's an example. If, if, I, if I wanted to see if there was a sex ego effect, let's suppose that I found that there was one, okay? And it turned out to be um, positive, okay? Well, we know that zero is male and one equals female, right? So what that, that's the way we coded it. I mean, um, and um, so a positive parameter on the ego effect of, of sex would tell us that uh, in women's houses, more out choices are made, net of all things, right? So you kind of have the out degree, which acts as a kind of an intercept for outgoing choices, if you will. But depending on the individual's sex, in addition, there is a, a tendency a systematic tendency in my hypothetical example here for um, women to make more out choices than men. So to predict uh, uh, the average number of out choices in a, in a male house, you would just use out degree. But for the female house, you would use out degree plus the sex effect. Get it? I mean, very typical, you know, dummy variable kind of stuff that you would do in any regression model. Um, so, so that's what that means. Um, sex, sex alter is, is interesting too, because um, basically that's, that's saying, um, now, you know, in, in, if you have a, a house where, um, where it's all male and all female, this, this really sex ego or sex alter is sufficient because they're gonna be symmetrical, right? I mean, you know, because every, everybody is an ego and everybody is an alter. So then, John, um, really, we just need to use one of those two. Not just one of those two, yeah. And you wouldn't use similarity because that's obviously it's impossible for, the, you know, people to make choices of someone of the opposite sex uh, in, in a house. But for all of the other um, uh, variables I listed there, you can use both a sex ego and a sex alter effect as well as a, a similarity effect. And I should explain that those are really important because um, we have hypothesized that there could be differences in social um, uh, attachment, for want of a better way to put it. I just I'm just seeking a generic term here for how um, you know embedded in the social culture, if you will, an individual is on the basis of how long they've been there what their recovery factor score looks like. Um, it, you know, sex is certainly a possibility too. And then differences uh, in those things by, by race too. Um, so those would all be very fundamental differences, which if we found them would not only um, help to control for those differences as we look for more, you know, um, possibly more, uh, uh, fine grain differences, but it would also make for the possibility that there would be systematic differences for those groups in terms of the uh, behavioral and network dynamics. And so it's basically a start at properly specifying a model to take care of those possible variations. Remember that with these models, we're starting out with the most highly pooled possible, right? We're assuming that all the networks are kind of the same and they have the same effects and so forth and so on. And um, this kind of gets us on a road towards a more realistic model, which, you know, with 
what we hope is adequate accuracy takes account of the fact that, you know, this is not the same for uh, individuals, uh, nor probably for houses. And we've already talked about the difficulties of separating individual from house level effects, but, but the object is to try to control for those things if they're a nuisance and to try to identify them if they're of substantive interest. And so, you know, experience has sort of shown that that's a good place to start. Okay, end so of John, soliloquy. So John, in, in res similarity, could you just go over that once again as to kind of what that covariate is? Well, if you look at the manual and look at the formula for a similarity effect, it's um, maximum when the two individuals have the same value on that variable. So it's like, you know, you take the two vari the variable for each individual and you subtract the one from the other. Um, and then you compare that to the biggest possible value that it could be, essentially. Um, and uh, if it's the biggest possible value that it could be, um, then um, that's the least similarity, basically. Um, well, yeah, the biggest... It'll be biggest when their similarity is identical. So it, it's, it's coded in um, the reverse of the difference, if you will, between the two. Um, so the idea there is that uh, if two individuals are more similar, since this index takes a maximal positive value when these two individuals have the same value on a particular variable, if there's a positive effect there, that implies what we call homophily. That is to say, an interest, uh, an individual, one individual is more likely to select another individual as a friend, um, the more alike they are to that individual on this particular variable. Um, and uh, that's, that would be of interest to us. I mean, it would be of sub some substantive interest to us uh, if that turned out to be the case. I have found no similarity effects at all so far on um, any of the factors that I just mentioned to you. Uh, surprisingly, I thought there would be some, but there aren't. So, but we so still need to check and make sure if there if if they are such if there are such things. So certainly, length of time in the house at baseline, I take it. Um, yeah. The um, sex, you know, of the house, um, you know, those are pretty clear covariates in terms mm -hmm. of analyses. It's a little bit unclear, kind of the recovery home, recovery factor, ego, alter, and similarity, recovery factor, similarity. So tell us how those would basically be covariates as well, particularly with the network, but more importantly, with the behavioral domain, how could it be a, re, a covariate as well as one of the key variables that you're looking at? Right. Well, it, it isn't one in the um, recovery factor equation. Um, or to put it another way, they're actually, you know, the, the linear and, and quadratic terms kind of take account of sort of the endogenous shape of the um, uh, recovery factor preference function already. Um, but that's not usually of a lot of substantive significance to us. So you're right. I mean, they only apply to the network part. Um, but the, um, as far as uh, their relevance to the network, uh, we often find that uh, in social networks, people who are better off in some way tend to pick each other as friends or associates or something like that. Um, and basically, the effect is one of um, um, assortativity. That is to say, people who have more social capital, if we assume that people who have more social capital are more desirable, let's say, as friends, then it would stand to reason that if I have more social capital, I'm more attractive as a friend, you know, to somebody to anybody but I'll be more interested in you if you have more social capital see what I mean so there's this tendency um, which uh, uh, we actually interestingly enough see in adolescent networks a lot for um, kids to assort themselves uh, 
in uh, along uh, behavioral lines. So the better behaved kids affiliate with each other, um, you know, and part, and we think part of the reason for that is that they have choices and the kids who have lower social capital don't have as many choices. And basically their, their only choices are other kids that have, um, uh, E an equal lack of social capital. Well, in this case, if you think of recovery as a kind of social capital you carry around with you, the same logic would apply. So, on the other hand, as I've said before, you know, on all the network models that I've run so far in this, I am not seeing that kind of assortativity happening. Uh, and indeed, the um, quality of life model that we published um, a year ago or so, uh, a year ago, a year and a half, yeah, something like that, a year and a half now, um, suggested that, um, if anything, it might be the opposite, that, that people who are better off actually made a, went out of their way to form relationships with individuals who were um, worse off. Well, we haven't seen any evidence of that either, because that would be like a similarity effect that had a negative parameter. It means that if you have, if you're more recovered, you're more likely to pick somebody who is less recovered, right? Um, so we haven't seen any evidence of that either so far um, in these larger analyses. But maybe this discussion uh, here can give you at least some idea of why you'd want to at least look at it and see if that that was relevant. So, so John, um, when you asked us to look at these eight covariates, right? Um, one thing you didn't mention was ethnicity. Um, and I didn't thought I? that wasn't one of your eight. I thought it, well, I thought it was, uh, well, the only ethnicity we really can look at is, is African-American because I don't think we have enough of anybody else. So let's go to Mike for a second because Mike has, for the recent paper, actually made a couple different comparisons. Mike, do you want to just give everybody a quick review of what we have with white, with Latino, with African American and other, it seems like we've got four groups, but of which data is probably only available in the first three. But Mike, could you just uh, okay. give everybody, if, if you happen to remember? Or yeah, there's 9%, um, well, okay, 78% white, 9% black, 10% Latino, and two or 3% all other. And that is the, uh, Latino in that case is um, distinguished from white. In other words, it's like white is really white non-Latino. So, so Mike, explain to us how you made comparisons. I know ultimately you looked at black versus all others, but did you look at Latinos versus all others? Um, did you look at white versus all others? I mean, did, did you have like three comparisons here with four groups? Yeah, I, I used the, uh, the big group as a comparison group and then contrasted the, the Blacks, the Latinos, and the all others. And what you see out of that is that there's, there's no difference between Latinos and whites and between all others and whites. But there is a difference between Blacks and whites. So you, then you say, oh, okay. All that matters here is whether you're black or not black, because it, there's no differences among the, the whites versus Latinos and all others. And, and the, the differences between, they're not only not significant, but they're very, also very small. So it, it works pretty well to just force the whites, to put the whites, the Latinos, and the all others in one group versus blacks. So that's, that's what I wound up doing in the growth curve analysis. So, so that's, but you started with comparing black versus white, Latino versus white, um, other versus white. So you really had that comparison, but you ultimately, what you have in the last paper was black versus all other, okay? So with that being said, um, what should we do with this analysis? Should we kind of put in a couple comparisons for this analysis, or should we just say, um, you know, black versus all others is the only one we should look at. So, so Mike and, and uh, um, 
Also, Myra. Myra is really an expert in ethnic issues, much more so than myself, certainly. Um, and, and also, John, I, I'd like to just get all your thoughts as to how we should approach this. Because in the setup, we do not have ethnicity right now. We do not have that variable defined. So that's something that we can do right now. And by the way, that's not a bad thing for, for everyone to see how we could go back to setup, put it actually in um, the script, and then show how we could basically run that. Um, once we have it in the script, then we can have a, a run, and then we can have some output. Of course, the output we wouldn't get it now, but at least you could all see how that goes. But, but first thing, Myra, do you have any thoughts on this issue yourself? Um, no, I think it's um, the way that Mike set up the group are fine, especially since that's how um, he found a significant effect of blacks versus everyone else in the study. So that sounds fine to me. Mike, what's your, what's your thoughts on it? Well, I, I think you have to do it on an analysis by analysis basis because what, yeah. you know, I was predicting growth curve parameters, but there's no guarantee that that has any, that that's going to generalize to the network stuff. I mean, it's when it takes two hours to run a model, that's painful. But um, if you don't, you know, if you don't start out with the more general set of contrasts, you won't know if it's going to collapse down to black versus not black. But right. once, you, once you've run it, John has said that, you know, you can do wall tests. So you run it with the, the three contrasts and then you test, use wall tests to show that it's black versus not black. That's an easy wall test that you can run after you've run, after the two hour model run, you can, use that wall test function to check and if you know if the wall test says nothing here then you could go with it well you, i mean just to be sure you could rerun it one more time wait two more hours but or you could just go with it from then on yeah um mike's right absolutely about about that um but let me just add one other important point here which is that given how long these models take to run and you can't just you know crank them out like you know looking at a whole bunch of things all at once but also given the fact that when you if you want to account for some covariate let's say you know it's ethnicity um you have to bear in mind that in general you're basically multiplying the number of ethnicity categories that you have by every single other variable in your model for the total number of effects. Because, you know, really in, in, in principle, it's possible not that you have just have main effects, which are sort of averages um, for, um, you know, whatever your outcome variable is, changes in ties or changes in your or, or behavior variable, but also in the effects themselves, that they might be contingent upon whatever those values are. So you need interaction effects with all of those different possibilities. And since you already have an awful lot of effects in these models as a general rule, you're talking about a model that's now, that's very quickly going to push up against how many degrees of freedom you have in your data. All right. So it's, I think it's an important thing to understand that that is a limitation of these kinds of models. They have to be, they can't be too complicated even though you'd like for them to be really complicated because generally speaking, you don't have enough volume of data nor enough variability in your data to estimate a complete model with everything in it that you would like to control for all at once. And so the way that we have to do this, at least at the present time, um, is to um, try to come up with the uh, a model that is at least reasonably plausible in terms of what it controls for, um, but is probably going to leave out some covariate contingencies that you might like to see. 
Um, and generally the strategy that I will take is to try to come up with a model that is plausible, even though it doesn't control for everything. I mean, if you find an effect while not controlling for certain other relevant covariates, then there's the possibility that adding those covari covariates could make that effect go away, right? Because they're basically um, alternative causes, if you will. But if you don't find an effect, even in a model where you don't have any controls, there's probably no effect. I mean, sometimes you do have these so-called suppressor variable effects, where an effect is only found within a subgroup, and that can happen. That absolutely can happen. But um, when that, you're not going to find that out by the very general analysis strategy. You've got to have a very specific hypothesis that this is an effect we only expect to find among, I don't know, African Americans, let's say. The, you know, for an example, and um, and then go in and, and focus on that subgroup and see whether you do find that effect there, and then worry about putting in as many controls as you can. So the idea is, you know, you don't start out by adding as many covariates as you possibly can, quite the opposite. You start out by adding the fewest that you can, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, but the reason that I mentioned these specific uh, covariates Lenny, is that um, these things are of substantive interest to us. I mean, if there really is a tendency for people who have been in the house a longer time to be more likely to be friends with each other and less likely to be friends with, um, uh, with people who have not been in for so long, then that raises other questions. The, question, the questions are, you know, how does a new person become socially established in the house? If, on the other hand, we see that people, if, we, if we'd seen that people who were in residence for a long time, we're more likely to adopt, you know, people who had been in the house for a short time, that question wouldn't be so relevant. We'd kind of know the answer to it. Um, and fortunately, what we're finding out is that, that it's neither fish nor fowl. It really doesn't have any effect on it one way or the other. So that's kind of an ongoing mystery about that question. Um, but that's the sort of question that you have to have in the back of your mind as you go through these um, iterations, you know, in terms of specifically what you're looking for. And the things that I'm looking for are, in particular, how does a person catch on um, with the social system? Right? You know, can we identify characteristics of the um, new people themselves or the people that they have available to choose from? that affect whether they form a friendship or form a, you know, trust relationship or whatever. Uh, and then how do those relationships interact with each other? Is one like a gateway to the other in some kind of a way? Or do they mutually reinforce each other? Things like that. So these are the kinds of questions that I have in the back of my mind when I'm thinking about a, um, the drivers of network ties. And then in terms of the behavior factor, which we haven't really talked about, yet in this particular iteration here. Um, we're thinking about what are the, what affiliations that a person might have, that is to say affiliations with individuals who are, you know, more or less recovered, shorter or longer time in the house, same ethnicity, different ethnicity, what have you. How do those different affiliations affect their recovery factor? Do they promote recovery? Do they inhibit recovery? Do they not have any effect on it one way or the other? Yeah, th thanks. Uh, so, so John, I'm just wondering, it, it might be just useful exercise um, for us to just look at the setup. Um, okay. Ted, Ted, could you just put your setup um, on here and we can just take a look at where we defined some of these variables doesn't mean we have to actually run it, but we can actually put it into our setup. You want to set up our CNN model, or are yeah, we yeah, just yeah. just just set up our CNN model, yeah. Oh, sorry, wrong one. So basically, this is like the brains of the whole system. It sets up. John, do you want to just tell everybody kind of what setup does, just for? Setup pulls raw data out of our um, raw data files, whether they're network or so-called, you know, survey or behavioral data files. Network data has to do with relationships, 
whereas um, the, the survey data is basically just characteristics or responses to the questionnaires by individuals at each wave that don't have to do with other relationships. Okay, so anything, and, and um, some of those are variable in time, such as their recovery factor items, and some of them are not, such as their, you know, uh, ethnicity, for instance. Okay, so if we, uh, let's see here. Ted, do you want to go to where we define? Why don't you, why don't you click on um, constant fixed covariates over there in the outline? Yeah, let's see what we have there. Okay, so you can see what the, the choices are there for, um, uh, for race. Really, ethnicity would be the proper way to say that. But anyhow, um, so I guess that what you're suggesting when is that we create a variable that has four, that partitions the sample into four categories. And those would be white, non-Hispanic, um, and, and I think what Mike said was white, black, white, other. So there'd be like three, three groups that Mike mentioned. Okay, so one is a category by itself. Where does two go? Does that go with Hispanic? Or excuse me, does that go with um, that? Is that is that just what we call black? So yeah, two is black. Who's black? Okay. And then um, seven, eight, nine, and 10 are um, all Latinx. Hispanic, yep. Latinx, yeah. And then you've got the other category. With and then other. Yeah, so, so in a sense. And by other, of course, we, we don't mean that they're all the same. It just means no. that we don't have enough of them it's to be able to say anything about any particular one of those groups. So what Mike said to us, he used that white as the comparison group. So that's about like 78 Right. So that's right. a large group. So right. we're going to compare the other groups to this reference group. If, uh -huh. if, that's, if that's what we want to do. Right. So I usually, when you do that, you, you set the, your reference group to a value of zero. Because that makes some, um, you know, dummy variables more easily. Uh, well, another way we could do that, we could do this to, you know, one, one of two ways. One of, one of them, and this is the one that I usually use, is I dummy code the, the categories. Um, because there's, there's no reasonable way to create a, um, to take a um, nominal variable that categorizes individuals into four ethnic categories and stick that into a regression model by itself. What you have to do instead is to assign one of the groups as the reference groups, so that'll be white. And then you have a dummy variable for African-American or not, Hispanic or not, other or not, okay? And so by definition, white is, they're all zeros, right? So if, you know, if you're not African-American and you're not Hispanic and you're not other, you're white. And that's the recover. That's the reference factor, and then you put in the um, other dummy variables as uh, well. You put in the other variables as dummy variables into your model. Typical regression strategy, right, Mike? And that's so the only. Does our Sienna not know about because our has these variables called factor variables, which sort of sometimes. A lot of times regression routines actually handle those fairly well. Yeah, no, it doesn't, it doesn't know from factors. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it's just, it's just a number as far as it's concerned. So a dummy variable, it doesn't have to have any special properties other than that it's zero and one. Actually it can be one and two, but that would be stupid. <laughs> you know, just moving the, uh, well. So, so, so John, if we want to write the script here, with mm. the reference point versus, um, you know, for example, um, zero versus one, one being, um, or zero, yeah. We, we have to retranslate some of these variables into the comparison. Right, what you would do is, um, what I would do is I would create 
three dummy variables. Right now, I've already got one called black, I think. Um, yeah, we do. It's two. It's, it's, it's no, 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 no. I mean that, that I've actually already created an RCN variable called black. Let's go down to the RCN object part of the script. And uh, no, that doesn't have that one in there yet. Um, or does it? Wait a second. You want to do a quick search to see if there's if if black is anywhere else, Ted? Let me just check and see. This is this is in the this is in the template now. So if you want to see how it's created. Um, you can go into uh, you can go up to github and you can pull pull the repo or just if you've already done that if you're repo if you're up to date with the repo just go over over to the um, uh, RCN setup branch and um, In fact, you know, it's probably going to be easier if I just show you in that branch So why don't you unshare your screen Ted and let me share mine? Mm. You know, you can always, if you want to, just go into a branch and, um, like, I don't know, copy a script or a piece of code or something like that out of it if you want to do that. And then go back to your branch and just paste it in. It's a very simple way to do it. Um, okay, you ready? Okay. There we go. All right, you should now be seeing a lovely Costa Rican sunset. Yep. Okay. And we have the script. And in our setup, oh, here we go. All right. So working backwards here, here's the RCNA constant covariate called rs.black, okay? Um, and uh, it is made from something called race BNB in the table called FX coves. So let's go back and find out where I created race BNB. I could really just kind of do this. BND is just black, not black. So, so John, John, that should be available in what Ted had as well. Ted should have that same script. He can get it. You can see right now that I'm in the, um, well, I'm in, in the, in my own branch here called Nets RecFact. But if I went to the, um, uh, RC and a setup script, you'll find the same code. I believe, I'm pretty sure you, that you will. If not, then you just let me know and I'll, uh, I'll put that in there. No, All Chad, right. it might be in right now. Ted, do you wanna just take a quick look it, at your covariate it, to see if you got black? It might, but why don't we just go through this right now and um, sure. Sure. we'll worry about that in a minute. Um, All right. So here's the FX coves script, which I pulled straight out of the survey data, right? From waves one to six, you all have that in your repos if you've cloned RH, uh, RCN setup, right? And you'll have all the stuff here where we, you know, um, have uh, sex, race, religion, blah, blah, blah. But it's basically just pulling all of these variables out of the script uh, and renaming them if necessary, but for the most part, not. Um, and um, now you'll notice the, when I created this binary variable here, I just use the if else function. If, if else is a vectorized function, that is to say it operates on the whole vector, um, that is to say column called race. And basically it says is, if race equals a value two, give it the value one, otherwise give it the value zero. 
So in other words, what I've done here is to create a dummy variable. Dummy means that it's, you know, just the values of one or zero, which is one if and only if the race variable has the value two. Well, we remember that up here, black non-Hispanic is two. So that's what we want, right? So this value, this is a very useful function, by the way, for, for coding and recoding, um, especially with dummy variables. Uh, because, you know, if it's equal to two, then, you know, give it this value one, otherwise give it the value zero. Um, if you have to have um, something, if you have to have a more um, uh, inclusive, if you have a, a more multiple, um, multivariate, uh, multi-value um, categorization, there's a couple of other ways you can do it. Um, there's, um, you know, you could set up a vector that has the values and say, you know, that if it's in this vector, then give it this value. And if it's not, give it that other value. Um, that would be one way to do it. And um, the uh, percent, the percent in operator is uh, useful for that. You use that, right, Mike? Percent in? Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, also there is a um, case, case when uh, syntax that's available in our, I can't remember if it's part of a specific package or not, but that can be useful too. That basically is just a way to recode a variable that I kind of like. There's other ways to do it, but personally I find the recode functions and stuff like that to be kind of weird and um, not terribly user friendly. So I tend to use case when a lot. Um, so that these are just other ways that you can recode variables. Uh, it's a very standard operation. Um, okay, so that's basically what you would have to do. You'd have to go back here, based on the race variable, create yet another variable here. See, notice this mutate here is mutating, creating multiple variables at the same time. So you would just put a comma here and you would say, let's say Latinx equals, um, let's see if I can get away with that. Um, oh yeah, well what I can do here is just say if uh, race is greater than or equal to seven. So what I'm gonna do here is if else race uh, greater than or equal to seven. Come on. And call it a one, otherwise call it a zero. Boom. That's all you need. And then that will get added here. And then we will come down here. So let's go ahead and do that just for the heck of it. Okay, never mind all that. It's complaining. Uh -huh. The max function is complaining. I did a kind of a sneaky little thing here with the max function to um, collapse this from uh, for for fixed effects. There's probably a better way to do that, but that works. Um, all right, and then. Um, Come down here and we'll say press dot dx. This is going to create a constant covariance, uh, constant covariate called fx pose dollar ltx. I'm, notice that I'm setting the dummy variables, generally speaking, to false, because there's no point in centering. An, uh, a, 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 generally speaking, by definition, when you have a quantitative variable, RCN will center it for you automatically. But you can tell it not to, and you should do that if you have a zero one variable, because although it doesn't affect the results, it sort of affects the, affects the way you interpret the results. 
um, if it's if it's centered versus if it isn't. So I generally set them to false. And so that just kind of, oops, what happened here? Oh, I see. What did I call that one? I think you got an uppercase C where you should have a lowercase. Hold on one second here. Oh yeah, Latinx, okay, never mind. John, you gotta you also have FX uppercase C rather than FX lowercase. Sorry, you're right. That's the eyes of a true coder. <laughs> yeah, that's why I have headaches every night. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So now that variable has been created and it is now a fixed cove. Uh, and I come over here to my script. Uh, where I'm going to do actual analyses, or I'm doing an actual analyses. And when I set up my data object here, I would add that uh, s dot, I call it LTX, yeah. And um, yeah, the end. And John, don't we want one other comparison, which would be other versus the white? Yeah, we could also go ahead and create that, but I leave that to the students and exercise. Okay. Well said. <laughs> well, I just showed you how to do it, so yeah. you should be able to do it. I just did black, so then I'll do the same way you did. With Sweet. The other one. Oh. Okay, dude. Okay, so, so that's... So any questions good. about that? It's, it's all pretty straightforward R stuff. Yeah, yeah, good. So, so do you want to just real quickly, John, go over your, your setup just for everybody? Because it's been a while since we talked about this. Just how setup kind of go through maybe the different parts so that we can just sort of see kind of why setup is really the starting point. It's got to be basically run. Uh, and then once it's run, you can then start doing analyses. Right. Well, the setup script, the, the purpose of it <clears throat> is to create objects that are going to be good for possibly a lot of analyses. Okay, so I haven't created every possible, and, and there's two parts to that, really. Well, three parts. One is I pull the variables out of, um, Kind of the raw data files that I have represented in my in my workspace here that started out I should add as SPSS files. In fact if you come all the way up here mm -hmm. well no um, actually this stuff doesn't start out with the SPSS files because long long ago back in days of yore I created a bunch of um, <clears throat> images, if you will, of the SPSS files that, that you guys all created from the um, original um, input that we had from, um, um, oh, what's the name of the uh, software that we use to collect the data or to put the Red data cap. in? Huh? Redcap. Redcap, uh, yeah, okay, sorry, blank on that for a second. Um, so there's some SPSS files here, but I created objects that are basically um, <clears throat> network objects, uh, longitudinal survey data, and non-longitudinal survey data that we can all use as you know a place to start for any analysis. But this script essentially takes those objects and creates a set of objects that RCN knows how to work with. So that's what this, you know, set up our Sienna script does. Um, and um, so you always start out um, by, well, in this case, there were some uh, individuals that we did and didn't want to include. 
in the analysis having to do with com completeness of data and um, you know issues of uh, changing houses or house sizes or lots of other things. And the easiest way for me to do that, because uh, Mike worked with, um, uh, with Megan and Meyer a lot on rationalizing those, um, it was easiest for me to just, you know, take the information that Mike provided me from that work and create a vector called SIDs to include. And then I would make selections out of this for the survey data so that I only have those SIDs at the relevant waves. And so that gave rise to this table here, longtb.net, that wave W1 to 6. So this is network data for waves 1 to 6 with only the SIDs that, that those guys um, identified as the ones we want to include. Um, this is all just some stats and some checking and some other things like that. And now starting right here, I start creating network sets using the uh, make network set function that um, <clears throat> is in the RH net tools package. <clears throat> and what that basically does is it creates a list of networks, all of whom have <coughs> the same node set. In this case, it's gonna be an N of 627 for all of them. Uh, one thing about RCNA is that it needs to have the same, because of the fact that it doesn't use IDs for individuals, it just uses a set of ordered matrices or vectors, that's what it boils down to. Um, and so it just treats the individuals of one through 627 as being the individuals it's gonna do the analysis on and the first individual has to always be the same in, um, so like if you have uh, wave one, the first individual individual uh, in a network there has to always refer to the same individual and as he or she is in wave two, three, four, five, six. Now that individual might not be there in all of those waves. That's okay, they can have missing data uh, for those periods and RCN has another way of identifying whether they're present in the analysis or not, okay? So to set this up, which would be kind of a pain in the neck if you, if you have to do it without IDs, um, Nate and I wrote this function which takes care of that. Um, and it basically just gives rise to a, let's see if I can find. So for example, this one here is best friend network where we use the definition that an individual gets a one in this network if and only if they choose another person, are chosen by another person as a best, a close friend, excuse me, um, or good friend, I can't remember which it was, close friend, I think. Close, um, close friend is minus one. Yeah, exactly. Um, by the way, the minus spec there is, um, takes care of the fact that some, some of these, um, relationships are coded in such such a way that a closer relationship is a bigger number and some are coded in such a way that a closer relationship is a smaller number so if it's negative that's means this number or smaller and if it's positive it's this number or bigger uh, is coded as a uh, as a one um, and so this creates a list consisting of six networks, six best friend networks, um, and uh, optionally um, one more uh, vector at the end, which is simply a list of all the 627 subject IDs to which it refers. So you have a way with this, it kind of carries along with it all the SIDs. In case for some reason, you need to go do something with this network set. You got to remember that the matrices that uh, it creates don't have any subject IDs. They're just n numbered one to 627. But if you want to know who those people are in terms of their SIDs, just go into the seventh element of this list and I'll show you what that looks like. Where's my BF net? 
Oh, interesting. I don't have this in here for some reason. Well, I, I'm not going to bother to create it right now because this is a little odd. Hold on a second. Oh, I know. I put this code in, but I didn't run it. It's, it's not that important. I just haven't had occasion to. Um, but let's come down to, let's look at FNet instead because it's the same thing. Notice that it's a list of seven elements. And the first, six of those are all 627 by 627 matrices, right? And then this one here is the table SID in any wave. So we can look at FNet. Um, and John, just for everybody, SID is just the ID number. They're subject ID, number. yeah, stands for subject ID. And so here is a, the first few rows of this SID in any wave table here. I'm sorry, I, I said it was a vector, but it's actually a set of vectors um, indicating, which indicate what house ID the person was in at each wave. Okay, and if it's NA, that means that they weren't in the study or they weren't participating in the study, one or the other. So this table is actually kind of a handy little thing to carry along. It not only tells you the 627 SIDs in order, but it also tells you if the person was in the study at a particular wave by virtue of whether he has a house ID, he or she has a house ID then or not. Okay, so there's a lot of information available in this and that's one of the reasons I just wanted to carry it along with the unidentified matrix data that RCN needs to work with. Because it would just give you a little more flexibility in terms of altering this object down the road if you needed to. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So it creates these different networks. Oh yeah, it looks like I said not run yet. <laughs> okay, so that's why it wasn't there. So, and it creates a loan network, and it creates an advice network. Um, and then it's going to make all of these things into um, suitable RCN objects. So, John, a quick question here. Yeah. If your analyses that you're actually going to run, in other words, not the setup, but the run, you're only interested in, like, friendship. Why do you need to basically have this larger one look at those other things like advice and loaning if you're not interested in that and your, your runs are only going to be on, you know, friendship. Well, it's just a work style thing, Lenny. I mean, there's no reason that you have to do it that way. You could just create the um, objects that you want on a kind of a just in time basis if you want. Uh, I kind of like to, maybe it's, be, it's because of my habit of working with sort of big complete data files that had fully scored data in them and all I had to do was you know sort of run out and grab the data if I wanted to get oh let's see I've got to get you know, this race variable okay well it's right there boom I've got it the other approach would be to say okay I need this race variable well I've got to recode it first and then you know blah 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 and basically do it as I need it but my thinking I would rather be in data management mode and get all the data set up the way I want it and then shift into analysis mode and not have to worry about the data management part very much. That's just a personal preference for me. I don't know how typical that is of, of other data analysts. Um, but when I do that stuff, I like to set up the data, most of the data that I think I might want to use anytime in the foreseeable future, kind of all at once and make sure that's okay. And then shift into analysis mode and start running analyses without having to, um, worry about the possibility that when I want to add another variable, I've got to go out and spend an hour or so doing a bunch of data management to get it right. See what I mean? Sure. So, you know, it, but do it any way you like, right? I mean, we all have our own preferences about, um, about how to do this. The disadvantage of that is that I might forget how I created that variable. And, you know, I, of course I can go back to the code and look, but, you know, if I'm lazy and don't do that, I might make a mistake um, because my my creation was um, too removed in time from my use. But for me, 
what I try to do in the data management script, and particularly in this script here, is to write the code in such a way that it's pretty easy for me go, to go back and see where it came from. And we, in fact, we just did that, right, with the African-American uh, dummy variable. So, um, so, so John, you just went back and you basically did some new coding, but you mm -hmm. already had basically the setup. So now that you've created yeah. something new, if yeah. you rerun setup, what does it do to that old kind of data that you had? Well, it just augments it. Since I'm, you know, in the particular case, for example, of um, having added the, let's find this here, where were we? So, so augmenting it, I understand, but what if it's a mistake? You find something that was wrong and now you want to correct it. Does that new setup correct it? If I correct the code, um, then, then it will. Yeah, that's the, the nice thing about this is that it, um, hold on just one second. Trying to find the um, fixed codes. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So you see, all I did was I just this this uh, fix FX coves table is created by all this code. So if I l add you know uh, my Latinx variable here, all that's happening is that. A table that used to have everything up to race BNB now has that plus also a Latinx um, value. So it recreates the whole table. And then I can save that in my workspace so that I don't have to recreate it next time. Um, wait, what happened? This, uh, repo, this workspace is starting to get a little big. <laughs> Takes a while to save, but there it is. It's all done. Okay, so now, now the version, and that that's the way I like to work. I like to keep the workspace up to date with the script, the way it's represented here. Um, there's other ways to do those things, but that's my personal preference. So it basically what happened, Len, is that this. F FX coves table here was replaced in the workspace by the new one, which has everything just as it was before with the addition of this variable. Okay. So one of the things that we can do, John, at some point very soon is mm -hmm. we can send this setup to the people on our call. So everyone will have this setup and then they can decide if they want to basically use it. They don't have to spend all the time that basically you were involved in Nate in setting it up. They just have to basically kind of accept the different chunks that they want and they'll have their own basically system. So that well, tremendous savings for everybody. You can always do that, okay? Um, I've, been, I've been a little slow in, in pushing this information up to, uh, to GitHub because my workspace is got, getting pretty big because it has a lot of, results objects in it and results objects have a tendency to be, to, to be kind of large. Um, like look at, um, a, a, as do some of these, well, the network variable, the fact that the network variables are large is okay because they don't keep accumulating. You only make one of them usually, but you can see there's a lot of stuff in here. That's, you know, multiple megabytes. And in fact, if we go into, we can actually see how big this thing is by, um, First of all, looking at the name of the workspace, the way I'm saving it, and it's called base workspace blah, 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 for all .r data. And so if I come down here to the files menu, um, okay. 
okay well that's not too bad it's only it's only 10 meg um hmm. surprising it's not bigger than that i think these workspaces do get some compression i could be wrong about that but i think they do um but in any case that was i've been a little slow about pushing that up but the rest of these um uh the rest of this script here, um, I, I'll, I'll just make sure I share it. And what you can then do is you can go, um, and I'm also trying to keep the stuff in set up uh, RCNA model that is contained in the RCNA setup branch over here. So what you just changed here. in terms I'm of- trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, hold on one second then. But I'm trying to keep the stuff that I have in this script here in RCN a setup so that anytime you can go look at that, you can clone your repo off of RCN a setup, is basically the idea, um, which you do by just going into RCN a setup and then creating your own branch from it. Okay. But if you already have a branch, the easier way to do that is to go into either my Nets Rec fact here, making sure you don't change anything and push it, right? Because you're not allowed to do that. Um, or into RCN setup, find the script and then just copy and paste it into your own. That'll work too. Okay, Lenny, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, I just wanted to make sure I had that last step down. That, that's you exactly bet. what I was going to ask. Yeah. yeah. Good. So, so once you have this, basically, you've, you've kind of gone through part of it. Mm -hmm. um, you basically just keep accepting these different chunks and then you're there, basically. Yeah. Yeah. All of this stuff will be, will be there. Um, I mean, it's good to have, it will be good when you have the um, confidence to kind of just, you know, write your own scripts and dash off and you know, deal with it the way you want to. Um, but if you ever want to go back and see, you know, how I created something or did it, you can always do that by just um, opening one of these different branches and going to look at it and copying and pasting some of it if you want. And of course, if it's unclear, feel free to email me and say, hey, I was just looking at this section of code here that um, I think does such and such, and is that really what it does? And, you know, is it up to date? Because, you know, I'm not perfect. I don't always uh, update this stuff as, as uh, you know, often as I should, um, but, I, but I try. Great. And then, real quickly, just go to your run script so everyone can see that. Basically, once you have this set up, you'll just go to the run, and then you'll be able to do some analyses. Right. The run script starts by creating a data object from these um, variables here, which have been put in RCN a format, right? So we have three, two uh, networks here, right? The advice and the loan network. And they're in a format now that, it's, that RCN can accept. Um, and that was done in the RCN setup script, right? Um, we have the recovery factor, which is a dependent variable, but it's a behavior variable. Um, but that's also in a format that, that we did in the previous script so that our Keanu will accept it. And then we also have sex, age, uh, time in residence, uh, African-American, Latinx, and um, this guy here, which is the uh, uh, composition change. Um, table. And the composition change table is created automatically for us by a um, format, uh, by a uh, uh, another function in our HNet tools. And it basically just makes reference to a make network set object. So you just have to give it the make, make network set and it will look through there, find out who is in the study at what time and create this object so you can just include it in the data object. And so again, you know, we have a data object, we have an effects object we have to create. Um, we have a model object, which tells it how to run the model. Um, and uh, then we essentially start adding effects to the effects object. And once it's um, in a shape that we want, we can look at it here. And once it's in a shape that we want, 
we go ahead and we call CN07, which is the estimation routine, and have it run a model and stick that model into a results object. And again, we use the results object sequentially. This one here right now is set up to use a um, standard set of initialization factors. But if I included this code here, then it would be selecting its start values from whatever variables are in this model. And we're also in the model called mod1.adlo.4. And so usually you use a previous results object to feed into the new one. Okay, so this is all review. We've talked about this a lot, but hopefully it's of some help. John, I have a question. Sure, man. Uh, can I share a screen real fast? Sure, I'll unshare. Lay the way. Okay, so I'm just, I've been listening to what you're saying too, and it made more sense this time. And then you were telling me to become a little more familiar with the script. So uh, we have friend network, right? That's one of the effects objects. And then we have right. close friend network. Yep. So yep. in your email, you said that you wanted to look at sex, ego, and alter for close friend and friend. So right. one of them was already there, the close friend. But then right. I made another one for friend. That's and right. And it, 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 it just... It, Yep, it just, all you have to do is add another uh, include effects with the different name that where the name, in other words, refers to the other dependent variable. The friend I did. Network. Perfect. Then when I looked at this, it came up, right? Friend network, both ego alter and then friend network, ego alter. And mm -hmm. then I ran this model. Is that yeah. right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you've got okay. transitive triplets there for both. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. So stay there one second. Because, so here's a question, John. You've got sex alter, sex ego. You've got both of them in there, okay? Yeah, you don't really need those. So the, the key question is, look down after RF under the kind of uh, behavior, and, and basically you don't see sex. Right. You just need to add it. So that, that would, would be... be this section? Yeah, it would be an F, an F from... Um, effect there. Yeah, so you should probably take out the, um, oh, that might be, if you're having problems with this, that would be why. If you have sex alter and sex ego, they're really the same effect right. in a house ah. where, you know, creating singularity there. So that's my mistake for not being clearer about that. I, I apologize. No, no. Just no, include I just one or the sure other. I was getting it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a good point, Lenny, that you made about that earlier, and I'm I'm sorry if I if I wasn't clear about that. I probably just um, neglect. I mean, it's the sort of thing I would have noticed if I went to run such a model myself, but you wouldn't, and and I just forgot to tell you. So I'm sorry. So remove alter. Yeah. Okay. Or you could remove ego. Same difference. Yeah, because it's one and the same. Yeah. Oh, but then I was confused. You were saying down here, I also need to add sex into, no, into. I would wait the, to, I would wait and run, you know, here. sex ego for the two network objects. And then in the next run after that, um, so if, if those two sex effects were significant, leave them in. If they weren't, take them out. Uh, and then try one for, um, for behavior. And it would be like an, what's called an F from E F F R O M effect. Um, and that effect, if you look it up in the manual is basically just, um, a way to see whether there is a, um, uh, well, if that, that would, that would be one where if it was uh, positive, um, it would mean that there was a tendency for, um, uh, females to have a higher recovery factor than males. Mm -hmm. Or to put it another way, um, you're more likely to improve your recovery factor if you're female than if you're male. Because remember the these function, are dynamic. The function is EFF from F-R-O-N. Yeah, I can't remember if it's a capital F or not. Um, 
I'll but, look it up. But look and see if I've got an F from here or somewhere in the script. Okay. God, it's really hard to pick these things out, isn't it? <laughs> oh, there it is. It's a capital F. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Thanks, John. I just wanted to share that and make sure that at least I was Pyramid. sort of on the right track. Totally. And then what okay. You, and then what you're saying, John, is basically you keep adding another thing or taking them out, but the model keeps growing if it makes sense. Exactly. Um, obviously, at a certain point, you can run into problems because the model can just get too big for the data you've got available. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, I say you need to be careful about how many of these effects you include in the model all at once. Um, what I'm advising here is based upon the, the results that I've already gotten from other analyses that suggest that most of the effects are probably not going to be significant. And so you're not going to continue to just sort of build them up and include them. Um, but because of the fact that friend and best friend are different, it might be that, you know, some of those effects that weren't significant in just the friend network could be in the close friend network. So John, and that's worth looking at to me. So John, by the way, this is work that you had done that I've summarized. We could just go mm. through it somewhat quickly, but this is basically, um, we're looking at friend, okay? So this is close yeah. friend and friend combined. So it's, right. it's one matrix. Right. And, and as we can see, um, these are all pretty good. The, the convergence is good, but there's only really... Actually, that's not too good. Um, you really want to have that in the range of around 0.25. So it's about... Ah, um, right. It's about seven times higher than you'd like to have it. But that's okay. I mean, when you start out with these things, you're not expecting to get a particularly great model. You're just trying to get an idea as to what's significant. And interestingly enough, although... Um, you might think that a significant parameter, a seemingly significant parameter, wouldn't be very reliably estimated given that kind of a convergence ratio. My experience has tended to be that um, usually if it's pretty significant, even with a bad convergence ratio, it will continue to be as you build up the model. But also the fit will get better and convergence will get better. What's happening is, you know, you're leaving out an important dimension of the, um, um, of the uh, 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 parameter space if you have a too simple a model. And that can often lead to um, kind of funky results. So, but it can usually be a good place to start. So basically, yeah, we want to get this down to about 0 0.2, 0 0.25, and, right. and it's going to go down. But and as it's going there, as it starts to go there, you know you're on the right track. But if it never goes there, then that means you need to stop and think. But before, basically the standard error into this particular number is over two. So, so basically right. you've got a T of anything over 1.96. So when it says density out degree, you look at that, you say, how would you interpret that, John? Well, that basically is a, because it's a positive parameter, it means that these networks are, um, tend to be relatively expansive. Uh, you can think of this in one of two ways, and they're both correct. Um, and one of them is that um, they're, well, it might be better to, to think about it in the reverse way. If out degree was negative, it would mean that there is not a strong tendency to, um, that, that the, the marginal value of adding whatever this relationship is, friendships, is negative. That is to say, the first friendship is the one that you're the most likely to form, and, and then after that, generally speaking, um, these friendships are added um, carefully and stingily, one might even say. But if it's positive, it's quite the opposite. It's like, you know, really almost the more you have, the more you want uh, from a dynamic point of view. But there's also a sort of a descriptive way of saying this too, which is that um, 
if um, it, it means that people have a tendency to make more than um, a that, that they tend to have more than um, uh, fifty percent of the alters as their friends. And how does that change over time, John? And uh, it maintains itself over time would be the right way to say it. Because this is kind of a, um, like I say, you can kind of think of this as an intercept. Um, and you'll notice that the, uh, the ratio there, 55 over 24 is, is um, greater than two. So we can say that that's statistically significant. Or 0.55 over 0.24. And obviously the same is true for reciprocity. Reciprocity is telling us there that if I have a tie to somebody else, they are more likely to reciprocate that tie or else we both drop our ties completely. So it's, it's indexing the fact that um, ties are more likely to be reciprocated or non-existent. Transitivity again, you know, if I, you know, am I friends with A and A is friends with B, um, then B and I are more likely to become friends over time and so forth. Now you're saying over time, but before you said it was the intercept. Well, that was the out degree in particular. Um, out degree has, has dynamic uh, relevance too, though, because it means that when it's positive like this, it means that um, the fact that I already have a lot of friends doesn't inhibit me from adding more friends. In fact, it's actually more likely. If it's negative, it means the more friends I have, the less likely I am to add another tie. But it also indicates that these networks are not very sparse if they're bigger than if that value is bigger than zero, descriptively. Now we've got a negative value for three cycles. Right, what that means is that the tendency to form uh, friendship relationships of A to B to C to A again is less likely controlling for the other effects, which includes transitivity, right? So net of all things, there is some kind of a component of friendship which is actually not, um, kind of not transitive in a way. I know that sounds a little bit contradictory, but it says that, you know, while some, um, while you have, while you can have transitivity in, in ties, there also is an element of, of what we sometimes call hierarchy, where A chooses B, B chooses C, but C doesn't choose A back again, because the friendship tie kind of went up, might have gone up a status hierarchy. And A doesn't want to be friends with C, even though there is this, you know, transitive chain going out from A to B to C. Um, because he or she considers themselves to be higher status. Okay, and now we also, for linear quadratic, we've got, again, the standard error going into these numbers is significant. It's over 1.96. Mm. And so, th those are basically just, you know, indicators of sort of how well the, um, that's an indication of the preference shape of the uh, recovery factor and doesn't really have a lot of substantive significance. It just means that in this case, we have a unimodal um, recovery factor preference function. Um, so that for any given value of whatever covariates there are, which are in fact are none right here, um, the, there's gonna be a preferred value of the recovery factor. Pre by preferred, I really mean modal, typical. And is the unimodal like a like a basin like this? It's uh, it's no, it's the other way. It's um, it's like concave this. down. Okay, that's because the negative. Right. Okay. So now you basically have added. You've gone from a convergence to one point seven. Now your convergence has gone to the next model three point two. So it's worse right, right. when you added the amount of time the alter and the amount of time the person has been in that house at baseline. Mm. So when we added these two, it's interesting. And yet these two are alter and ego, but this is not alter and ego. So why would this differ here to all of a sudden you don't have 
the alter ego here? Well, in this model, um, I added, um, I think, scroll up again, what was in the previous model? All right, I didn't have anything about um, in res time, okay? Nope. Nope. So I added three effects here, which was a little bit risky because it might have, the model might have not been done very well. And that might partly explain, by the way, this poor convergence. But the poor convergence could also be explained by the fact that I have two non-significant parameters in here, in res L alter and effect from um, in res L here, um, of which the worst is probably the effect number 10, RS dot in res L alter. Um, so the first thing I would do here is I would take out, probably take out RS in res L alter I would leave in in res L ego because this is pretty clearly indicating that people who have been in the house for a longer time are more likely to make out choices than people who have not. Well, that figures because they know more people and they've known them for a longer time. People who are newer, on the other hand, you know, uh, haven't had a time, have, haven't had a chance to make a friend or close friend relationship with some people, probably. And so that would explain that. Um, I would not probably leave in the effect from RS dot in res L in the recovery factor part of the model um, because um, basically what, what that is saying is it's a, it's a positive value. So it says that, um, you know, people who are, have been in the house for a long time longer time are more likely than people who have not to be improving their recovery factor, but it's not statistically significant. And since I know from Mike's models that actually the, the opposite seems to be true, I probably would just take that out as an unreliable effect. Okay, here's a remarkable thing. From 3.2, finally we get under 0.2 on convergence. Right. So, so that's remarkable. And yet, look at that. You kept both of them in and you also kept this one in, but what you only did here was you added sex ego yeah. and sex. Now, how come you added sex ego here and not sex ego here? Uh, well, um, because in the, there are different kinds of effects on behaviors than there are on networks, okay? You don't have an ego at alter for a recovery factor. You're just talking about a you know, basically a continuous variable, um, which can change there. Um, so, uh, I mean, you can ask about the effects on the people that somebody is connected with and how that might affect the individual's recovery factor. But the definition of an RF ego, um, for, okay, so RSX ego up here, or RS in res L ego. These are both, how does the uh, sex or the amount of time in residence that the, that the individual has had affect their likelihood of making out choices? That's what an ego effect is, right? So we see that um, individuals, there, there's, well, there's no significant effect, ego effect of sex, right? Because actually the parameter value is less than the standard error. So that shouldn't be in there. Um, but now we know it, okay. Uh, we still see that the alter effect is statistically significant for in res L. Uh, oh, sorry, no, it's not. I, I missed the decimal point there. So that's not significant, so that can come out. But we do find that the ego effect is still significant as from the previous model. So one of the things is that I definitely probably am gonna wanna keep this um, in res L ego effect. So here's the, here's the interesting models. thing, John. You basically put sex into this model here, which wasn't converging well. Right. Once you put sex into this, now it's converging well, but that's the only change you made was put sex in here. Well, I think the biggest, the biggest um, difference here was uh, the effect from RS.sex in the recovery factor part of the model, because you can see that's quite highly significant. Uh -huh. None of the other effects, new effects that I put in, namely sex ego, uh, in res L alter, or, well, I guess that's still there, not thrown in there. Uh, and the uh, effect from um, 
the F from of in res L here, none of those effects were significant, in spite of which adding the sex effect here, which was significant, basically made the model converge better. So tell us. So, so that's telling you that that really has to be in there, that that sex difference in the recovery factor really has a big effect on the way the um, these uh, networks and this recovery factor co-evolve. And because it's negative, what does that mean, John? It means, well, remember that, you know, sex is dummy coded, zero male, one female. So it means that females, women are less likely to improve in their recovery factors than, than males. Yeah, it, things. It, it also looks like the, uh, does, does the sex effect on the recovery factor pertain to any of those other rates or linear shape or quadratic shape? No, it's just, well, it pertains to it in the sense of that um, it would, um, uh, it would, well, what it would do is um, it would affect um, where the location of the mode is, okay? So if you want to think about it that way, um, the uh, linear shape and quadratic shape parameters indicate a particular mode for the population as a whole, but that mode is moved lower, okay, um, on the scale for women than it is for men. Because it, it looks like there's a pretty good shift in the linear shape. Yeah. From the By the way, you... You could also see whether the quadratic shape parameter is affected by sex. This is only affecting the linear part. Because up in the previous model, the linear is 0 0.30. Right. And now here it's 0.5. So it looks like a pretty healthy increase in the linear. Yeah. So what that really is kind of saying, let's think about that for a second. That's saying that um, for for females, um, you have to net out these two, right? Effect from sex and linear shape, so that your linear shape, you know, as a kind of a um, location parameter, is um, going to be about this number, 0.499 for males, but it's going to be um, much closer to zero for females, because you net these two things out here. Um, you and up here, because we didn't have sex, it kind of took the average of the two. You see, so it's it's sort of saying that the recovery factor um, for, for, for um, for males is quite a lot higher than it is for females. Is what I would say there. Yeah, you know, it looked like from the growth curve analysis that the women were lower, but they also tended to spend mm -hmm. less time in the house. Ah, okay. So like, like they kind of came in, took care of business and got out of them. Right. Whereas in some of the, in some of the male households, people would hang around for a long time. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, we should see correspondences, Mike, between the um, analyses that you did and, and, you know, and these in a lot of instances. And I would worry if what we were seeing was, was, was not in some way compatible. So let's, let's go on to the next one. Basically, at this point, you basically are, again, great convergence. Yeah, um, pretty good. And what you have is ego, alter ego, in degree. Now, this is one of the big differences here. You have this in degree. Right, but um, it's not significant. Not significant, but that's what you added. And yet you have. And I kept in in res L just to see if that, you know, made any difference. Yeah. And sex was still pretty strong. Yeah. Um, and I kept in the other parameters too for the uh, for the network. And so there wasn't much change in the significance of, of anything. Yeah. Um, this was basically, in other words, this was a failed attempt to see whether when I added in degree that that might make a big difference in everything. So tell um, us what in degree means, John. 
Well, it would mean that um, individuals who get a lot of um, uh, friendship nominations from others uh, are more relatively more or less likely to improve their recovery factor. And it turns out they're a little less likely, interestingly enough, and that might be partly because they're, if you're more recovered, you've probably been in the house longer and you've approved as much as you're gonna improve, right? But the effect is not statistically significant. Um, I mean, the parameter is bigger than the standard error, but the T ratio there would only be, um, you know, around 1.1, 1.2 maybe. So, you know, if 1.96 is what you need to be significant, we're not really very close. So that doesn't look as though it's, it's relevant. But I was just curious to see if it, might, if it might have an effect. All right, let's go to the next one. Now the convergence gets, so what do you make about convergence getting worse? Is that a significant worse or is that really not a yeah. big deal? No, th that, it, this is modeled, the convergence is fine here, especially for a preliminary model. So take a look. Um, now we have ego, sex ego, alter ego. We still have those two. We yep. have this. Now here's what you did. You basically changed that to out degree. Yeah. Now I wanted to see whether maybe it made a difference in terms of how many people you picked as a friend. Uh, if that changed your um, tendency to improve your recovery factor. And once again, no. Okay. Now let's kind of jump to the next one. Boom. 0.14, that's, that's the best we've had. Right, but again, I mean, don't, it, you're, it sounds to me as though you're, you're thinking about this as being something like an R squared, yeah, sort of a reverse R squared, it isn't. It isn't, okay. No, don't but think of it that way. But here's the big change. You basically put average alter here. Right, so oh. this is a big one. This was the first really interesting substantive effect we've had here. Um, and you'll notice that in the RF model, we now have two more or less significant effects. Um, the average alter effect isn't quite statistically significant. Um, I think the, the uh, p-value would be around 0.07 or something like that. But certainly at this phase of model um, development, I, I would look at, I would want to hang on to that. And it's a big deal because what it's saying is, if you have a lot of alters, who have a higher recovery factor, you will intend you you will tend to improve your recovery factor more. And so we've talked about this before, but that's what we call an influence effect. So basically, affiliating with those who have a higher recovery factor tends to improve your recovery factor. Really, a big deal. Um, well, and then we've noticed we notice that we still have the insignificant sex ego and in all alter effects in there. I'm probably going to get rid of those sooner or later, but I just, you know, I, I don't want to make too many changes in the model all at once if, if they don't seem to be mucking up the, uh, the results. Okay, so now we go to the next one where right. you have similarity you've placed in. Right, all right. This was a place where I wanted to see whether individuals, that, I wanted to see if that assortativity effect might happen on um, the recovery factor. Uh, and so that's what, that's what we're seeing there, that similarity effect. And there is directionally some tendency for that, interestingly enough, but it's not statistically significant. So that's one of those where I might or might not keep it in the model going forward. It seems to be that there is some tendency for people who have a higher recovery factor to choose each other. And this would also mean that people who have a, a lower I, I, who tend to have a lower recovery factor tend to choose each other as well. Um, but the evidence isn't strong, right? I mean, the, um, uh, what would the T ratio be there? there it would be point, you know, 0.92 over 0.72, um, which is about 1.25 or so, 1.3. Um, so, you know, your p-value there is, you know, two-tailed is going to be down around, um, I don't know, 0 0.15, 0 0.20, something like that. All right. Uh, so there's some evidence, but, you know, and yeah, so you notice that's why I said worth remembering. I'm not <laughs> so ready to jump so and shout about that, but I want to remember it. So, so you kept it in. You basically yeah. have your ego, your alter, your ego, um, yeah. and you also have... 
Half the effect from, yep, and effect from sex. So that is kind of like the, um, that might be the best model that I've got so far in friendship. There's an indication that there's an average alter effect. That's a big deal. There's an indication that um, um, there's a in res ego effect, which I want to hang on to. And maybe there's an in res, uh, uh, a in res L similarity effect that's analogous to the one that I got for the recovery factor. It's positive, but it's not statistically significant. So, so from my looking at this, it looks like identical to the model we have above it. Not quite, um, because the one above had RF similarity and this one has in res similarity. Ah, got it, got it. So that's the difference. Yeah. So, so this is becomes different from RF similarity. Right. Now we have, got it, so that's different. Now we know that people who have been in the house longer tend to have higher recovery factors. So those two are probably correlated. So one of the things that's going on in my mind now is, well, could there be uh, a similarity effect of uh, recovery factor independent of for, for um, time in house? And so I might wanna try those both in the, same, in the same model, which will have a problem with the, that they'll tend to be correlated and so they might be harder to distinguish. But if one effect is significantly stronger than the other, it might actually bring it out if I do that. So I don't know whether I actually got down to this in this uh, set of so here's another one. script yet. Now you've got two similarities. Yep, that's it. See, that's exactly what I was talking about. <laughs> and interestingly enough, it does look as though the um, they kind of both have around the same effect, and maybe the in res l similarity effect has gotten a little bit stronger. And is there a reason that you don't have more things down here? I don't know. Well, no, because th th those I'm just, th I'm not focusing on that right now. Okay. I'm kind of saying, okay, I've got, a, I've got a pretty, what looks like a pretty good model of the recovery factor right now. You know, all the effects in there are statistically significant. I'm going to leave that alone. And I'm going to start asking the question of, well, okay, if individuals who have, who affiliate with, others who have a better recovery factor do better, can I figure out anything about what would make somebody more likely to affiliate with somebody who has a higher recovery factor? So now I'm focusing on the network part of the model and trying to figure that part out. So what makes people select others that have higher recovery factors? That's the question we're, we're asking now. And uh, it turns out that, well, don't, don't go away yet. Let's go back up and look at the, um, uh, in model nine, excuse me. Yeah, in the uh, model that has, that's at the, I can't even talk anymore. Um, that has the convergence ratio of 0.1338, that one there. Um, basically, I had an idea um, that, I explained earlier about the similarity of both in res L and RF and including them both in the same model was only moderately successful. It looks as though there is some more tendency towards selecting as similar um, uh, or so a preference for somebody who has the same amount of time in the house as you, you know, whether it's a small amount or a larger amount. Um, and the evidence for that is stronger than it is for selecting people on the basis of the same recovery factor. Um, but it's still not strong in an absolute sense because that 0.7097 over 0.4596 is not really very close to two. Um, so, but we'll see. I mean, that's something we have to remember going forward. There's some tendency for that. Maybe it'll turn out that this is true in some kind of subgroups, even if it's not true overall, okay? So that a more finely specified model will identify significance um, for those, uh, uh, for that kind of similarity uh, among individuals who have some other kind of characteristics that we haven't identified yet. Let's 
see what else we had. So now we've got... You see my comment there. Um, we don't have any um, eco or alter effects of recovery factor alone if you include time in residence. And you added basically these. Yeah, and they're not significant. So hopefully we won't see them again. All right, and this is the last one. So let's take a look, what do you think? Okay, so we have the sex ego effect that I can probably get rid of because that's not significant. We have in res L ego, yes. Uh, in res L similarity, it's not significant, but I'm hanging on to it anyway. Let me just um, check and see what that ratio actually is. So, 572 by Three. All right, well, that value, that in res L similarity value is actually significant at, in a one-tailed test. And since I would probably hypothesize that that kind of similarity would be expected, you could justify a one-tailed test there, as a matter of fact. Um, so what we see here is that is a model which is kind of more or less complete in the sense that all of the effects, except for the sex ego effect there, RS dot sex ego, all of the effects are, you know, um, in the network part of the model are more or less significant, except for the sex effect, which I'll probably take out. And if we go down to the behavior part, what did I do here? I added this, I got the sex effect, um, ah, okay, I see what I, one thing I changed here was I used a total alter effect instead of an average alter effect. And it actually turns out that the average alter effect is um, more relevant. Average alter is, it does not take in a, into account how many, uh, how many others you have, uh, whereas total, total alter actually does take that into account. It doesn't average them out, it just sums them up. Um, and uh, the average alter effect seems to be more relevant. So it doesn't matter how many other friends you have, it just matters um, uh, that you have some. And that is actually kind of consistent, Lenny, with the uh, uh, study that, that you keep mentioning that you, know, you and Ed, I think, and some others did a few years back that showed that if you had, you just needed one friend and that made it more likely that you would hang around. And if you hang around longer, that would tend to mean that you would improve your recovery, right? Yeah, yeah. And so this result would be consistent, you know, if we compare that to the average alter effect that we had before, this finding here, the total alter is not as important, is consistent with, um, with that result. So, so here's, here's the question, John. I mean, by the way, thank you. This was really helpful to go through this and just okay. see the logic going right. from one model to the other. Mm -hmm. so, so now we have two matrices. We've got a matrix of basically, if you're a friend or close friend, you're a tie. And we have another matrix that you're just a close friend, you're a tie. And do we basically bring them together, we have brought them together to run some simple analyses right. we started doing. Is that what you think we should do now is put them together and run through comparable, I mean, basically the covariates that you indicated and sort of see what it looks like? That's exactly it. What I'm really trying to do is to reproduce the model that, that I have here, which only included one of the networks trying to distinguish whether the effects that I found here, which would mainly be, um, well, uh, the um, in res L ego and in res L similarity effects, okay, uh, here, and also the average alter, which is not in this model, it's in the previous one, and the effect from sex 
uh, in the, well, the RF model could be exactly the same, have an average alter effect and an effect from sex. Okay, in addition to your linear and quadratic. So that doesn't have to change at all because there's only one of those equations, even though you have two equations, one for friend and one for close friend, right? But what I want to see is whether the effects of that, um, uh, that I found for um, just friendship, when you don't include friendship too, obtain for the friendship network or the close friend network or both or neither when you run, when you separate the close friend and the friend networks. So I'd like to see a, um, if we want to scroll up again to the previous model, which is still the best model. This one here is like the best one. Yeah. I want to see the same recovery factor model. That is to say linear shape, quadratic shape, average author and sex. Okay. And then I want to see whether, um, you have um, uh, an in res L ego effect, an in res L similarity effect, um, or and an RF um, similarity effect. And whether that effect, those effects that I just mentioned there, obtain in both friendship networks, only one of them, or only one of them. And it's almost certainly one of those two possibilities. So just to make sure we now have this data for the combined, whether you're basically, a, it's a minus two, minus yeah. two or minus one. Uh -huh. We could replicate this for minus one to see what we get, which is just close friend. And right. then we would have it for friend, close friend here. And then we'd have it as a close friend and we could sort of compare those two. Right. It's possible that these results that I'm getting for the, the friend network really are, are effects in the close friend network only, but I'm seeing them here because the close friend network is kind of included in this result here since I don't separate, separately differentiate it. So we can do it separately and then put them together and see what happens. Yeah, what I would try is... Um, you try them in one network and not the other, then you try them in the other network and not the one. And um, then if there's, if, if it turns out that they don't appear in one, but do appear in the other, then that's probably your final model. Um, but if they do appear in each one when you don't include them in the other and they're significant, then you'd want to try them in both at the same time. So in other words, add them to close friend, but not friend and add them to friend, but not close friend separately. Okay. And then if there's, if they're significant in both, then and only then would you include them in a, a, yet another model where you had them in both. So I just want to make sure when you say friend, but not close friend, that's a, that's a matrix we have not been working on up till now. We've only been working on friend plus close friend, and we've been working on now just close friend. So those well, no, I'm just trying to differentiate the, uh, the, the two networks that you have in your analysis now. Uh, you know, one of them is close friend only, and the other one is both. Yeah. Okay. So we'll keep with those two matrices. Right. Yeah. right. But if you see if you can see if the effect, if these effects that we have for just, you know, my model here where I don't differentiate friend, close friend, or, you know, close friend only. If you, you can see if that effect is something that happens um, just in the close friend network, you know, just try it in just in the close friend network, but don't put the effects in the friend network. Then do the reverse. And if it turns out that these effects show up in one network, but not the other, um, you don't need to do any more. But if they seem to be significant in both, then I would try to put them in both and see if, if they actually still occur simultaneously in both networks. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. That's, it, it's much easier to do it than it is to say it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well I, I think this is, we, we sort of see the next step that we'll take. Yeah. I think that. That's Good. It. Uh, okay. 
how, how would you do that, John, with, um, if you were going to do just friend and not close friend, right? would you say, okay, all your enemies are zeros and all your close friends are zeros and only the people who are just your friends are ones? No, that's not exactly what I'm saying. Um, what I'm saying, I'm just talking about, you know, predictive effects here. So um, if you scroll up to the next model above, Lenny, all right, right there, that one. No, oh, no, no, too far. Yeah, that one right there. Um, is that it? I don't know if that's it. Scroll down one more. One more model. Okay, right there. Yeah, no, that was, I did want the previous one, I'm sorry. So I'm looking at these and I have to sort of quickly determine what's in everything. And so yeah, I think you said 10 was the one that you liked the best. Was it? Go up one more. I'm not sure. Okay, right there. Yeah, I think so. And I we'll think get, it is. And we'll get rid of this this variable, this code variable. Get rid of that one. Um, and then run the rest. And, and get rid of that RF alter one that's there. You don't want that. Right. Okay. And so the mo this model should have sex, uh, well, and not, not sex ego. It should have in res L ego and in res L similarity only. Okay, and then it should have the same effects that we see for the, um, it should be identical to the current RF model here. Keep, keep but what you want to do, so what you want to do is try the um, uh, in res L ego and in res L similarity effects in first in the close friend network, but not in the friend or close friend network, and then reverse that take them out of the close friend network and put them into the friend or close friend network and see what you get there. In the event that it's significant, that these are significant in both of those, then put them in both of them and try it and see what happens. But my guess is you're probably going to find significance in only one of those two networks, either the close friend network or the friend or close friend network. Got it. And that will then tell us something about the different dynamics that occur uh, in those two degrees of closeness, or it might turn out that we get the same effects of different magnitudes in both of those networks. And, and John, you like 22 and 23, I take it. 22 and 23. Yeah, just leave those. Leave yep. that the way it is. Yep, yep, yep. You don't have to mess with that equation yep. at all for now. All right, I think uh, this will be fun. We'll, uh, we'll play around with this and report back on Tuesday. Let me know what happens. Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, yeah. Sounds exciting. All, All right. right. We've gone uh, a couple hours. Um, I know we haven't uh, given a lot of people chances. Let me just give a little space. Does anybody else have any questions they want to ask John on what he's thinking about or, or about anything that people are working on? I know it's getting a little bit late. Okay. Okay. Have a great weekend, John. This was great. Very sure. helpful. And uh, we will uh, keep pushing, as they say. All right, guys. Thanks for everything. Um, nice to see everybody or hear everybody or see their names anyway, if they're not <laughs> the real them. Absolutely. You guys have a, have a good, safe weekend, okay? Okay. Yeah. Thanks, John. You too. Sounds good. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Bye, all. All right.